Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Frederick. I am an instructor of history at Penn State Altoona, and I am the co-author of the book Hang Tough, the World War II Letters and Artifacts of Major Dick Winters. And for all of the teachers tuning in today, uh, I hope that this presentation will be insightful and helpful and hopefully give you some insights on perhaps how to use primary sources in the classroom and bring stories of the past to life for your students. Our book is, uh, it's a variety of different things. It incorporates World War II letters from an iconic World War II officer who is famously portrayed in the HBO miniseries, Band of Brothers. It gives insights not only into his life, but his times as well. And additionally, uh, there is a broad assortment of uh, rare photographs, artifacts, and we're going to offer a little bit of story and context behind those as well. For all of you history buffs who are out there, uh, you've possibly heard of Major Dick Winters. And we start off our book by drawing a parallel between he and another iconic American officer. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who gained fame during the American Civil War. And both of these men were the oldest sons of their families. They were raised by pacifist mothers. Uh, they had to overcome the obstacles of being rather shy and reserved children. And they overcame their obstacles. And they relied on the, the power of education and learning to rise to their full potentials. And they put those skills to good use by fighting in the iconic clashes of their ages, respectively the Battle of Gettysburg and also the Battle for Normandy in 1944. And both men became historians in their own right. They kept meticulous records as to their battlefield experiences and also the men that they fought beside. And in turn, those documents became the inspiration for very popular writers who wrote very iconic books that were widely read by the American populace, respectively The Killer Angels by Michael Shera and Band of Brothers by Stephen Ambrose. And in turn, those books were made into wildly successful films that spurred a lot of attention and awareness about the battles that these two men fought in, and then that, in turn, is followed by commemoration, often in bronze or at various historic sites, both in the United States and overseas. And a pattern emerges here. And we can begin to see how often it is not just history in itself that inspires us, but rather it is popular culture, the role of books, media, movies that encourage us to think about what is a hero? Who is a notable military officer? And certainly these other elements go a long way in helping us to ponder these important questions. Dick Winters served in about a half dozen countries during the Second World War. And this map offers us a brief glimpse of some of the vast swaths of territory that he covered between the spring of 1944 and the summer of 1945. Of course, like hundreds of thousands of allied combatants, he starts off in Great Britain in the first half of 1944 as the allies are preparing for that big step across the English Channel that will culminate on D-Day, June 6th, 1944. And throughout the remainder of the war, Dick Winters and his men of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment within the 101st Airborne Division would also fight in Belgium, Germany, Austria, and they would endure some of the most pivotal and grueling battles of that age. In many ways, though, our story goes beyond the battlefield, and it also offers some rich perspective of the home front as well. 
Dick Winters was actually born during World War I, not too far away from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And when he graduated from Franklin and Marshall College in the fateful year of 1941, uh, he thereafter joined the peacetime army because there was a compulsory draft underway. And he was of the mind that he would just rather get his one year of service out of the way and then he could move on with his life. And one of the initial places where he went to was Camp Croft, South Carolina. And on his uh, rare day off, uh, on weekends perhaps, uh, he ventured to the nearby city of Asheville, North Carolina, which we can see in the background of our PowerPoint here. And while he was at Camp Croft, this is really where uh, Dick Winters further sharpened his abilities at leadership. As we can see in this top photograph on the screen, he very much became a mentor. And it was his cool confidence and his stoical bearing that really allowed him to nurture this image, this position, uh, the beginnings of his leadership. And indeed, he would continue to craft his leadership because in four short years, he would go from being a private and enlisted man to the rank of major, which is so unparalleled. Um, and he was very much a rarity in this regard uh, among Americans who served in the Second World War. And it is while he was visiting Asheville, North Carolina, that he became friends with a local young woman by the name of Dieta Allman. And in Dick Winters' so uh, small social circle, uh, he was introduced to Dieta, and they quickly became friends. They started a written correspondence uh, on various weekends. The two of them would even go horseback riding around the Biltmore Estate in Asheville. Um, and that is one of the photographs that we can see here with the two of them on horseback. And on one day, December 7th, 1941, they rode back from town and they found out that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And it was during that time uh, that this written correspondence uh, accelerated. And two days after Pearl Harbor, uh, Dick Winters wrote to Dieta uh, with these kind of fond memories uh, that he was already envisioning. The warm fireplace, soft music, a newspaper, odors and sound of a good steak dinner in the making, a quiet, peaceful dinner, a ride through the majestic mountains, and a hostess with a way of entertaining and making you feel at home. It was a dream. This really commenced uh, an even more vibrant written relationship that these two individuals held during the Second World War. Uh, she served as a counselor, someone who was constantly listening uh, to Dick's thoughts and uh, allowed him to vent during times of hardship. And Dieta, too, would join the military service. Uh, she joined the Naval Reserves uh, for women known as the Waves. And by the time we get to early 1943, after Dick had become an officer, uh, he decided that he wanted to reach the next level. And what he ultimately decided to do was join this experimental branch of the army that was known as the Airborne. And he found a new home within the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. And one of the, the daily rituals of his airborne training outside of Toccoa, Georgia, was to climb this mountain with his men that was known as Curahi. And as he wrote to Dieta that February in 1943, Curahi is our motto, our battle cry. It's taken from the mountain Curahi at Toccoa, Georgia. That one three miles high, rising 1,200 feet that we used to run up. The record was 42 minutes. I made it in 44 one day. I am strictly no runner, though. Just did it by plugging along. When I hit Europe in my travels, you'll have a letter from each country the 506 takes and a souvenir. And that includes Berlin and Tokyo, if I must do it myself. And in these words, 
we get a true sense of his confidence, his inner strength, and that is something that he is going to be demonstrating even more so in the years and months to come. This was perhaps no more apparent than in the early morning hours of June 6, 1944, when Dick was among the 13,000 paratroopers and glider men who were landing behind enemy lines in Normandy, France. And in the immediate aftermath of D-Day, Dick wrote a D-Day diary, as he called it, where he offered a very vivid firsthand account of some of the things that he endured, including his initial arrival in Normandy. And in here, uh, he writes in retrospect, almost in, in real time, it's 1.10, red light, 10 minutes out, all's quiet. Ah, there's some anti-aircraft fire, blue, green, red tracers coming up to meet us. Gee, it seems to come slow. They're pretty wild with it. There, looks like they might have hit one of our planes. Look out, they're after us now. And uh, with, with this vivid language, he helps to describe these early moments of the Normandy invasion. And things certainly did not get much better after he and his men landed on the ground not too far away from St. Mary Glees. And he said of this moment, those church bells that just tolled made me stop a moment for they brought back memories of the last time I heard church bells ring. This is what he's writing in retrospect from England after the invasion. That was in France, D-Day, and they weren't tolling a request for us to come to church but an alarm to all the countryside that we'd arrived. What followed, of course, is history, but it sure gave me a funny feeling. Machine gun fire and rifle fire didn't scare me, but those bells, being all alone with only a knife, gave me the feeling that we were being hunted, you know, almost like dogs, as he says. And so it, it shows us this insider perspective of how this very stoical leader uh, it just uh, exhibited a slight bit of fear in this hour of desperation. And in the coming months, as he continued to fight in France and in Holland, with each passing campaign, he continued to wonder, will I survive all of this carnage? And eventually, he does get a little bit of a breather in mid-December of 1944, when, as we can see in this photo, he gets to visit Paris, France. And as he wrote to Dieta, what a town that is. Boy, it really is all they say about it. Even after taking into consideration the fact that I'd been around civil that I hadn't been around civilization for some time, it's still some town. Went on a tour and found out how many people were beheaded here and how many nuts and bolts in the Eiffel Tower and all the rest of the worthless information. Took in a couple of good shows, bought some clothes. And the best of all, I got to sleep between two sheets on a bed with springs. Yep, and I even had a good hot bath. Boy, what a time. And this really underscores the level of deprivation and difficulty that so many soldiers on the front lines endured, where something as simple as a bath or clean sheets, things that we take for granted, are really considered to be luxury items here. This break, though, was to be short-lived because it was only a few days later that Dick Winters became embroiled in one of the hardest campaigns that he would fight. Known as the Ardennes Campaign, also known as the Battle of the Bulge. And for around two weeks, he and his men of the 101st Airborne were largely surrounded at the Belgian crossroads town of Bastogne. And here is where they put up a fight for the ages, not only overcoming the odds of successive German attacks, but also one of the most brutal European winners in half a century. And despite the fact that he and his men emerged victorious in this campaign, it certainly took a psychological toll on he and his men, as we can get a sense of in a letter that he writes to Dieta in late January of 1945. 
And he writes, since I'm in the army, I daydream of fights, fighting Jerry's, outmaneuvering, outthinking, outshooting, and outfighting them. But they're tense, cruel, hard, and bitter. They consist of about 80% of my dreams, but they pay off. You'd be surprised. Sometimes when you dream over and over a problem, you get the solution. And here we can get a sense that uh, Winters was coping with the psychological toll of combat. But even in this moment of darkness, he was trying to find a silver lining from the various struggles that he had gone through in the previous weeks. And so he was a thinker. He was a problem solver. And here he is illustrating that very point to Dieta Allman back home. By the time we get to May of 1945, uh, he and his fellow paratroopers gain a note of distinction for becoming some of the first Allied troops to arrive in Berchtesgaden which was in Germany, not too far away from the Alps, as we can see from this photograph, uh, which was the symbolic home of Nazi Germany. And here uh, we can see Dick and his fellow officers um, enjoying the fruits of victory on essentially Hitler's front porch. And it was during this hour of victory where Dick was also pondering whether he should go to the Pacific to fight the Japanese. And in one of the most telling of quotations that he writes back home, he explains his rationale for wishing to go and fight in the Pacific theater of the war. He says, how can I sit back and see others take men out and get them killed because they don't know? They don't have it. Maybe I'll get hurt or killed for my trouble, but so what if I can make it possible for many others to go home? Their mothers want them too, the same as me. So what else can I do and still hold my own self-respect as an officer and a man? These are incredibly powerful words. This is an individual who is willing to put his life on the line yet again on the opposite side of the globe because he felt that he needed to put his combat experience to the best of use to lead men and potentially to save Americans. Incredibly powerful words. Luckily though, the war in the Pacific ends before Dick Winters or any of his soldiers have the opportunity to go to that corner of the world. Winters returns home in these years after the war. He lives a long, fruitful life became involved in agriculture, by and large lived the simple life of a farmer, all while keeping historical record of his men and his beloved Easy Company. And as we can see here, as he sits in his home office, that space was a essentially a shrine uh, to the heroics of his men. And in one post-war interview, Dick Winters offered some fitting motivation that I think all of us could take some comfort in, in these similar times of hardship. And this is what he said. I have one message to all. Hang tough. Do your best every day. You don't have to know all the answers. No way. Don't expect that of yourself. Just do your best. Satisfy yourself so at the end of the day, you can look in the mirror after you've brushed your teeth and say honestly to yourself, today I did my best. If you do that, everything is going to be okay. And indeed, these are wise words from a life well lived. And it is these stories, as well as many more, uh, that you can learn more about in our book, Hang Tough. And my co-author, Eric Dorr, uh, very shortly, will be offering you a virtual tour of his museum at the Gettysburg Museum of History, where he will show you firsthand some of the artifacts and mementos that Dick Winters used during the Second World War. So I wish you all a happy holidays, and as Dick Winters would have said, hang tough. 
My name is Eric Dorr. I'm the curator at the Gettysburg Museum of History. I'm also the co-author of the book Hang Tough. In the book Hang Tough, we feature a bunch of Major Dick Winter's personal artifacts and other artifacts that relate to Easy Company and the 101st Airborne. And I'm going to go over a few of the items featured in the book today. And I, I think I, what I want to do is kind of go a little bit in order um, of his journey. So the first thing I want to show you is this book. It's called Infantry in Battle. And that's a guidebook of combat tactics. And my co-author, Jared, it seems to be his favorite artifact. But the interesting thing about it, Major Winters highlights uh, different passages in the book. And you can see how he developed his techniques directly from that book. And it's a really interesting piece. Uh, the next piece I want to show you is uh, Major Winner's jump certificate right here. So when he went to, to uh, airborne school, he graduated and he actually took jump training at Tacoa. The officers did. And that certificate is signed by Colonel uh, Robert Sink. Very interesting artifact and that is his original right there. So we're going to go now to England and uh, Major Winners and Easy Company were billeted in a, in a town called Aldbourne and he had a host family named the Barneses and uh, one of the artifacts we have in the book is this gift which was a book that was given to Major Winners by the Barnes family and you can see there's an inscription there it was a Christmas gift in uh, what is it December of 43 and there's also the Christmas card right there and of course one of the things since we're looking down there that I did miss from the training days is this this is the dog um, draftee and that was the dog that followed them on a march from Tacoa to Atlanta and the dog started following them along and uh, he de developed a limp because it was a long march, and um, Dewitt Lowry, who, who is featured in that picture, put him in his musette bag and carried him around. And that story went out to newspapers across the country. And a lady made this uh, mascot, um, I guess you would call it a dog uh, blanket or something, with E Company 506 Parachute Division on there, which is incorrect, it should be Parachute Infantry. But it's still a very interesting artifact from the days in from Tacoa to Atlanta. So uh, the next thing I want to feature is uh, I want to get into a little bit since we we only have a few minutes here. I want to get into some of the D-Day items. And uh, of course, Major Winters is famous for taking a gun battery at, uh, at a place called Braycourt Manor. And uh, he after that con after that battle, he wrote a, a, an account of what happened. And we feature this in the book. And what's, what's significant about this account is it was written right after the battle, or a few weeks. It's actually dated uh, 22nd of June, 1944. And it's, it's uh, six pages. And he actually um, created a map down here of Braycourt Manor. And it was when he was, when it was fresh in his mind. And that's why this account is so special. And, it is featured in the book Hang Tough. And during that assault, um, he, he, Major Winters was presented for that action the Distinguished Service Cross Medal. And we have Major Winters' Distinguished Service Cross over here. This is the original that was presented to him according to his notes um, at a ceremony just afterwards and there's a press release and a newspaper article about that action. So of course the Distinguished Service Cross is our, sec our nation's second highest award for valor. He was initially put in for the Medal of Honor but it was, he ended up getting the Distinguished Service Cross. Still a very uh, high medal. Um, so moving along watching our time I'd like to go into the Battle of Carentan. Uh, here is a very interesting artifact from Carentan. Major Winters took those gloves from a German paratrooper, an enemy soldier. It was a trophy of war. And there's a picture of him later in life wearing those very gloves. And, uh, you know, these guys 
picked up things from enemy soldiers, usually weapons, sometimes a helmet, sometimes gloves, parachute smocks, various items. And it's very, very interesting artifact from Karen Tan. So let's let's go to uh, Holland. You know, this, the second main action was Holland. And I want to feature his uniform here. Th this is his jump jacket. It's the M43 jacket. And this is Major Winner's jacket. And he's wearing that one or one like it in the famous picture that was taken of him in Skunderlach in Holland in the famous archway. And uh, one of the interesting things about this, which you can't see because it's behind it, is he sewed a map case into the back so he didn't have to actually physically carry a map case. Uh, Major Winters was very conscious of the fact that snipers would pick out officers and try to pick them off. He, he tried to cover his collar brass when he could. He generally wore a net around his helmet to cover up his rank. And he tried not to carry a binocular case or a map case when he could and he had that special pocket sewn into the back so he had a built-in map case and he generally kept his binoculars when he needed them around his neck and would tuck them into his jacket. So another artifact that I wanted to feature and I, I am kind of jumping around here because uh, it is out of order in our exhibit but I wanted to show this because this actually is in the book and this is a parachute reserve so they would have a T5 on their back and then they would have a reserve unit on their front and this is one that's actually still packed from D-Day this was recovered in Normandy France and I opened it a little here so you can see it um, there's the the reserve white parachute the main parachute would be camouflage the reserve would be white and this is still packed as it was for D-Day and it was discarded by a paratrooper and picked up by a local in Normandy and you see these initials on the back of it it's stamped RS which stands for Robert Sink each of the airborne equipment that was used was meaning the, the parachute, the reserves, the May West and certain other things were marked with their commanding officers uh, initials and that way it, it, the purpose was to recover it later and um, and reuse it and that way they it wouldn't get mixed up with the other parachute regiments. Um, going back to D-Day again and, and I apologize for not keeping this in order I'm gonna step off camera for a second and I, I'd like you to look at that photograph up there of men from Easy Company and a few guys in the back from the 4th Infantry Division now that photograph was used on the cover of Banner Brothers and it's become one of the more iconic photos and probably the most famous photograph of Easy Company. And uh, it was taken by the guy on the left, in the front left, or, or it was from, from his collection, Forrest Guth. Um, but I wanted to point that out because it is such an iconic photo and this is the original negative from his camera of that image and it's hard to see because it's in negative of course but in my opinion this is probably the most iconic photograph of Easy Company and it was taken just after D-Day um, in, in the town of St. Marie de Mont right near Utah Beach and that was right when the 4th Infantry Division had hooked up with Easy Company or with the 101st Airborne and the Airborne units so it is almost the anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge and when this is actually shown I guess it will be the anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge and um, I, I'd like to show you this jacket um, this is a B-15 aviator jacket and this was Major Winner's jacket and it's actually an Air Corps jacket and some of the officers from the 101st got these jackets and if you notice on the shoulder sleeve patch the screaming eagle patch there but there's a white background and that was because these originally had a silk screen image of the army air corps um, insignia and so the 101st patch didn't quite cover it so they they put these uh, extra little 
um, enhancement around our Screaming Eagle patch. And you can see there's a very famous picture of um, some of the other guys. Um, I, I believe General McAuliffe's jacket is done in the same way. And you can see his name there, R.D. Winters. And he probably wore this over top of his 43 jacket, of course, as we know, Bastogne was very, very cold. And these jackets are made for aviators and cold weather, and they actually worked really well. And Major Winters was fortunate enough to be one of those officers that got one of those jackets. And um, I'm going to step off camera again. And since we're talking about Bastogne here for a moment, um, I, I want to show you one of the most iconic pieces of airborne or 101st Airborne paper. And this is the famous nuts letter and uh, this was distributed amongst the men on Christmas and it's a Christmas message and it, and it recalls what General McAuliffe said to the German commander when the German commander asked for their surrender and it says nuts and it, it was a good mor morale booster for those men. And these were printed in in black ink and some of them were printed in blue ink such as this one. Now I'm going to ask you to scan up a little bit if you can to uh, over here there's another one in black ink and that particular one was um, the nuts letter that belonged to Edward Babe Heffron who was one of Major Winner's men and he was also one of the other uh, iconic Easy Company soldiers. So he ended up getting a uh, black uh, ink version and of course I just showed you the blue ink version and uh, I think we'll go to Major Winner's pistol and ID um, th this is Major Winner's officer's ID he carried it he, he had put a, a plastic coating around it would have his fingerprint and it would be folded up but and you can see what's interesting about it is as he went up in rank, he crossed out his rank and, and filled in and the last one there. It started as lieutenant and then and, and, uh, ended up major. And I really like that photograph of him too. It's a, it's a great photo. And directly behind that ID is his 1911-45 sidearm. And that gun went with him pretty much through most of World War II. It was it was on issued during training. He had it. He left it in his trunk for D-Day. The story goes from the, our notes in his files that um, he he left it behind because he had gotten another one. And of course, if you know the story of Band of Brothers, you know that um, he lost his weapon and he ended up getting that one later. So he didn't have it at D-Day, but he had it through most of the other uh, time he was in World War II. And it has a lot of holster wear, and you can see it's a very aged weapon. Um, I, I see we're kind of running a little low on time so I'm going to speed it up a little bit here. I want to focus on this four pocket jacket here. This is his class A uniform and that's a picture of him wearing the same uniform. This photo was taken when he went back home in December of 1945 and he had two photographs, this one and this one taken of him wearing that very jacket and, and in, in the same configuration. And it has the very iconic Type 8 Eagle patch on the left sleeve. And, and those are um, one of the most beautiful types of the Screaming Eagle patches. There are certain uh, variations in them, and the collectors like that one the best. And since we're really lo low on time, and I, I, I could keep going and going, but um, one of the things I want to show you is Hitler's silver. Now, we have a photo in, in the book of some of Hitler's silver. Some of the men who were lucky enough to get Hitler's silver, it, it was probably the most prized war trophy. And um, Major Winters got some silver from the, the Berchtesgarten Hof, um, which was a hotel, and it still had Nazi markings. But the real iconic stuff is the stuff that actually came from Hitler's house, the Berghof, or the um, Eagle's Nest. And it would have an A and an H on there. And I'm going to show you something. I'm going to step off camera and I'm going to bring back something here that's amazing. This is the smoker tray. And we have a picture of some of Hitler's silver. But this, Hitler allowed smoking only on the tariff of, of, of the Berghof and outside. Um, and so he would have waiters bring these out. This is a cigar box, a cigarette box, and a match pack. And then this would be a candle holder, and the, you could light your cigars with that. It would have a candle on. And 
This is, um, and each, each piece has the AH and the Eagle monogram on it, and it's certainly one of the uh, rarer pieces. It's very unusual to get a complete one. And um, the men that were lucky enough to get some of Hitler's silver, well, they got the most prized war trophies, that's for sure. Well, I hope you enjoyed my presentation, and I hope you enjoy the book, Hang Tough.